year that the city can collect from the district. So we have four more years, or a maximum of four more years. Uh, we receive gross increment from the county, and then pursuant to the special legislation, we have to do a couple things. We have to return the county's piece. We get to pay administrative costs of the district. And then the, then the funds, the, the remaining net tax increment can only be used for two purposes. The first of which is paying off uh, debt service on target center bonds. That's the first priority. And then the second is uh, neighborhood revitalization purposes. Um, that term has become, uh, become known or become defined, I should say, as the operations and programs of NCR up to this point. But other eligible costs would also include um, eligible costs of the neighborhood revitalization program. So in other words, the repayment of this loan, as, it's, as we're calling it. So we have a question, I think, for you from Council Member Fry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Is the county the only other jurisdiction to which funds are repaid? Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Council Member Fry, yes, just the county. Thank you. Uh, at the moment, uh, the last time the TIF plan was amended for this TIF district was when 2011. And of course, we were still in the recession at that time. Property values had dropped. So um, the projection of the amount of gross increment to be collected over the life of that TIF district was in the $148 million range. Uh, since that time, of course, uh, the recession has ended. Property values have increased significantly in the city. And current projections indicate that over the life of the district, the city could collect gross increment of a little over 180 million. Now, 180 million is the maximum amount we could collect pursuant to an agreement that we were required to enter into with the county at the beginning of the district. Um, and there's a, a memorandum of understanding with the county that actually specifies this number of 180 million. Uh, now, you might want to ask, you know, we were at 148 and now we're at 180 million. Uh, that's uh, a, rel a, a good increase. It, driven predominantly by market values going up. Um, if we limit ourselves to the 147, which the current plans um, currently specifies, we would not have enough money to pay off the target center bonds and fund NCR through 2020. So that's part of the reason why the increase is more than the $9.14 million. So this is um, good news. And uh, um, in order to uh, be able to take advantage of these new projections. We'll have to amend the TIF plan. That requires uh, public hearings, notifications, and other actions the Planning Commission has to take a look at it. So that will take several months, and that will, um, that will happen whether this particular action on the repayment of the NRP funds happens or not, because we really need to update those projections to get that TIF plan current. So we have flexibility to do um, so we have flexibility to pay off all the target center bonds and fund NCR at very least. So I just wanted to clarify, um, we would, however, have enough funds under the ceiling to do the first year, even if we didn't increase the um, overall maximum to the district, correct? Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, council members, yes. But um, if, we're, if we were still bound by the 147 and we um, repay the three point, um, I can't remember the number now, the 3.39 million. Uh, that means what we're taking 3.39 million away from either target center bonds or NCR probably in the year 2020, so. Right, I, I think I asked that for two reasons. One, to say we can still move forward with this plan while we're yes. waiting for that ultimately, because ultimately when we're gonna suffer, if we don't increase it to 180 million is in uh, 2019 or maybe 20, 2020. Probably 2020 is 2020. when we'll really see. So, and although I think um, our assumption, those of us who are bringing this forward, is that we will uh, that we'll make that decision later this year. Hopefully. Okay. Right. And there's a couple more questions. Um, I didn't see who was first, but Councilmember Bender. Well, I like to do a gender balance. Thank you, Mr. Chair. That wasn't necessary. I I don't want to 
this is sort of related to this, but it was just a bigger question. Um, because all of my neighborhood organizations did their NRP phase two approvals before I took office. So I wasn't part of that community process that went into those. And I just note some, many of them were really on the ball. And so it's been now more than 10 years since the plan was adopted. And so I just wondered, it's not completely, the, the idea that we're putting more money back in is just giving the opportunity to ask this question. Um, is, you know, is there a time frame at which we think that plans have maybe become out of date or as we're updating our comprehensive plan and identifying community priorities through that process or other ways, are we kind of trying to make sure that they are aligned? I'm not saying they aren't necessarily. I just don't know those details of how, um, you know, that community involvement was done. And then some of these neighborhoods, for example, over the last 10 years, um, if you just take the issue of housing, I think the issues and dynamics have changed significantly because of market forces and so I have neighborhoods, for example, now where most of my constituents contact me very concerned about rising housing costs and affordability of housing. And so it isn't so much about, um, you know, like helping bring the market there. It's about, you know, we're at risk of displacement because there isn't enough housing in the neighborhood. So anyway, that's just kind of a long winded way to ask if we've considered reviewing um, um, plans after a certain time frame, we're just kind of making sure that they're still aligned with overall city priorities and goals, as well as the community there in each neighborhood. I think I'll defer to Mr. Rubidor on that one. <laughs> <laughs> Chair Goodman and uh, uh, committee members, uh, Council Member Bender, um, I think I felt that was a little bit more appropriate for me to answer. The, uh, the council adopted um, an NRP expenditure fund policy last year, uh, which directly addresses that very issue. And that after seven years, we have a check in with neighborhood organizations to ensure that they have reached a certain threshold of how much money they have spent. It's a fairly high threshold. But correct me if I'm wrong, it's around 80, 90 percent? Yeah, 85 percent. 85 percent expended, 95 percent contracted. So if the plans are have to be less than seven years old. If it's longer than that, then either we do a review with them to see if there's some extenuating circumstance. For example, if they parked a lot of money in a development that's been just basically in limbo for a period of time, or they have to go back and do a re kind of a engagement with the community to refresh their plan and, and, and to update it. Um, so that, that is built into the process at this time. And that's if they have a significant amount of unspent funds after seven years or so. Uh, uh, sure, uh, Gordon and uh, uh, Council Member, I did not understand that. The refresh comes if a neighborhood organization has a significant amount of funding left unspent after seven years after their plan has been adopted. I didn't remember those details. Uh, uh, Chair Gordon and uh, Council Member Bender, if I understand you correctly, um, after seven years, they have to hit those thresholds of about expenditures or contracts. If they haven't, then they have to go back and re-engage the community to refresh their plan. I'm not sure if I understood your question correctly, though. I'm sorry. Okay. Council Member Fry also has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so you, you mentioned just a second ago that uh, a large part of the surplus in um, in TIF funds was due to an increase in valuation of the property itself. Um, thank you. Um, do we have any idea the percentage breakdown of simple increase of property value just because the market is turning up versus increase in value due to the fact that there's now a building on the property that was previously largely vacant? Uh, Mr. Chair, Council Member Fry, I, I don't. You know, the uh, consolidated SIP district is huge. I think there's 5,000 parcels in it. So uh, we don't regularly monitor, uh, you know, by block or anything like that. It's we, we kind of look at the total. So sure. Uh, I've seen a map before. You don't by chance have a map of the consolidated TIF district on here? Uh, yes, I do, actually. Yeah, it's like, right. So we'll start in the north side. Okay. Yeah, so that's, uh, it starts up in the north Washington uh, Park industrial area, comes down through North Loop. Uh, there's another little section, um, nothing really in the core of downtown, um, along the river over by the Guthrie, so that's Industry Square area. Uh, Loring Park is in it. And then uh, if you move the map down a little bit, there's another 
down or whoops, I'm sorry, up, excuse me. Um, then there's another little area at Hennepin and Lake too that's included as part of it. Uh, all these areas were old pre-79 TIF districts that existed at one point in time and they all were decertified back in 2009. So um, that's that's the composition basically. Yeah, and that, that makes a lot of sense. The areas that are included uh, constitute somewhere in the range of about 25% of the total new development and investment in the entire city. Um, and it makes sense that uh, that the investment is being distributed citywide. I think that is a, a tremendous boost for our boost for our neighborhoods. Um, and I think it's something to cheer about. You know, so uh, when when substantial development happens in either New North Loop or in uh, East Town, um, it's not just of a, a boost to those specific neighborhoods. I think it helps the whole city. I think it might be. I'm sorry. I think it might actually be helpful if we could include the, this map um, in the, in the packet, perhaps online somehow, and get it um, oh, sure. sent in. I think yep. it's, it's a question. I'm not sure if it would be enormously useful for the public, but other council members have asked, um, especially council members who haven't been here as long as I. What is the TIF district? Where are the boundaries? What is the property? So I think that's something that we can do and make sure it's available online with the report um, after the sure. meeting. Absolutely. And did you? Um, did you have more you wanted to? Did you have more you wanted to talk about? Uh, I guess uh, the one uh, the one item that I didn't cover was um, is how the is the repayment schedule. Uh, so as as noted in your report and on the slide here, um, repayment uh, will occur in the following way. So for any of those uh, phase two plans that have frozen fund balances less than fifty five thousand those neighborhoods um, will be repaid back 100% this year, probably at the end of the year. Uh, for the phase two plans with frozen uh, fund balances between 55 and 155,000, those will be paid back 50% this year and 50% next year. And then all the remaining ones that have balances above 155,000 will be paid back 25% a year for four years. So that's the proposed repayment schedule. And this is a recommendation that finance came forward with just to make sure we had the necessary funds in place as we were making the payouts or what's the rationale? Of, um, for doing uh, this? You know, um, are you familiar? Chair Gordon and, and the committee members, yeah, the purpose was to make sure that we could in fact have the money in the bank before we were paying it out. So for 2017, we know that we'll have the 3.9 million uh, and then it will be dependent on revenues coming in the following year. So uh, it really is contingent upon the revenue, uh, the TIF district still being able to generate the revenues to support the program. I think that makes sense. I'll just note that um, for those of us who got excited about this idea originally, it was when we discovered that there was over $10 million in the, in the year ending cash balance. So we said there's money right now in the cash balance to cover these. Um, let's explore um, getting this back. And restoring it to the neighborhoods. Um, nevertheless, I recognize that having a uh, cash balance is a good thing. We might want to keep some in reserve year after year, so paying it out in, in these installments um, makes sense to me, and I can certainly support that. Uh, Chair Gordon and the committee members, just a, a touch on the last slide. Um, Mark uh, um, has already reviewed uh, this, but basically it would require further action by the council to amend the consolidated uh, TIF district plan, um, and that would be brought forward by uh, financial property services within the next few months. If that action isn't taken, as you mentioned, then uh, we would not be able to move forward with the repayment of these funds. So, so that, that okay. concludes our presentation. Thank you very much. Councilmember Wright, do you have a question or comment? Uh, comment, thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, for indulging me in your committee. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to thank the work uh, that was put forward. I was there on the uh, cold winter month when we took the vote uh, under extraordinary pressures, financial pressures, to make that adjustment at the expense of the community groups that had to make that sacrifice. But I always held out hope that we would find a way to make right and, and sort of make them whole. Uh, and so the work that went into it to have be flexible, creative on the financial end and the department's end, I think is much appreciated and to be applauded. I think we struck a balance to be, as Councilmember Gordon was pointed out, to kind of 
ease into this, but with, with some uh, financial uh, sort of responsibility, but still do the right thing by communities that made a sacrifice uh, to the overall city budget, but now can move forward and do their good work that was so well expressed in the earlier preamble to what the department and the program has done over the years. So uh, I really appreciate the work and the chairman's work uh, and diligence on this from, from day one. We said we'd make it right, so thank you. Thank you very much. So I would like to move then the uh, action. There's actually two uh, pieces of this. The first is authorizing the finance and property services and NCR departments to allow neighborhood organizations to contract up to 100% of their approved NRP phase two allocations, inclusive of the 2012 CPP equity funds according to the recapitalization schedule um, that is included. And the second is passage of a resolution, and this is actually an amendment to the uh, 2017 general appropriation resolution um, to transfer um, the, the three million three hundred and ninety thousand five hundred and ninety seven dollars and increasing um, the community planning and economic development department revenue estimate um, in the neighborhood revitalization program fund um, accordingly by the same amount and also um, amending it to increase the appropriation for the uh, community planning economic development department in the consolidated TIF district fund um, by that same amount from the existing fund balance. Um, and, and as I move that, I want to note that um, Council Members Reich, um, Barbara Johnson, and Andrew Johnson, and Lisa Goodman have all asked to be co-authors of the resolution, along with myself and Council Member Quincy. So those two items are before us. I think we can vote on and discuss them together. Um, Council Member Glidden. Thanks, Mr. Uh, Chair, and I guess I, I would say you could put my name on, on there too if everybody else is doing that, but I think uh, you helped do the work to work with staff and identify this was the moment that made sense. I also have been on the council long enough to have been here at the time when we had to take this action, and I will tell you I remember that it was our promise to the neighborhoods that when we were able to restore those funds, we would do so. So to me, this is about our promise to the neighborhoods uh, and their ability to uh, use the funds in a neighborhood directed way. I think we can always talk about how we can better support the neighborhoods in doing some of those tasks, but this is about restoring their ability to make change in their neighborhoods and I support that. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, Council Member Bender. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so in a little different position, not having been on the council when the original decision was made, um, I appreciated the extra time and care you took to, you know, talk with all of us about this. And um, I just wanted to know that this is significant because I think we're entering a time where we have a lot of potential financial uncertainty for the city. And so for us to take this action now shows our commitment to um, the kind of grassroots democracy that we see in the best case when we have neighborhood organizations that are really delivering for folks who need it most in our city. And just as one example, one of the neighborhood organizations that is getting funding back is, is CARAG in my ward. And they've set aside about that same amount of money to help finance a building for very low income families to welcome um, families into their neighborhood and in a place where, again, housing costs are ra ra rapidly rising. Um, and so we have so many stories and examples of that over the years in Minneapolis. And I think um, in, in previous times when there, were, when, you know, there were recessions or budgetary issues, having this money go directly to people in neighborhoods across our city ensured that our neighborhoods stayed as strong as they could. So I am somebody who's been committed to trying to make sure that this system of of funding, again, reflects the values that I hear from my constituents and the needs of everyone in the community, including those who aren't able to make it to evening meetings, as so many aren't. Um, and I see so much of that um, passion and commitment in a lot of my neighborhood organizations as well. But, um, you know, just again, wanted to note that, um, you know, we're really relying on all the, uh, there's a lot of staff here, we're relying on you to, um, you know, hear and, and be that sort of front line um, as we go forward over these next years in our city, which um, we we know are probably going to be tough in a lot of ways. Councilmember Fry. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd also like to add my name to the chorus of, of co-authors as well, and um, I'm, I'm pleased that this allocation is made. Obviously, I, along with Councilmember uh, Bender, were, were not there um, during the initial action several years ago, but I think this is a, this is a, a welcomed uh, this is welcome to progress right now. And looking out into the audience, I see a lot of people that are incessantly involved in their neighborhoods, that are involved on a very micro level. In fact, it's sometimes shocking 
the amount of knowledge they know about some of these specific projects. It, I think that very deep-seated knowledge is uh, ultimately lends itself to successful projects. And I won't call anybody out because I'm going to leave somebody out, but thank you. Thank you very much. I did want to note a couple things um, just to, that I thought of during our discussion here. Um, I think one of the reasons um, or one of the things that we're doing as we phase this in um, over a period of four years um, and we still have the same priority listing of where the money goes to first, if there is some kind of uh, terrible economic collapse, and I think in these uncertain times of what's going on there could be, but there are some safeguards because um, we have, we'll have, an, and there is a, a risk, a certain risk that we won't have all the revenue that we're committing to now because if we fall short of our projections, which I, I have great confidence in the finance department to be coming up with good, good uh, projections, but if we do fall short, that means that we will have to potentially make some cuts back. Um, so we can acknowledge that and we can say there is some kind of safeguard if, if the worst happens. But I also um, am hoping that with this, um, investment into our neighborhood organizations, that they do take an opportunity to review their, their phase two plans and they look at where they're putting their resources. Obviously, there'll still be requirements about investing in housing, um, but anybody can modify their action plans if they go through the appropriate processes. And it, it, it depends on how much money they want to reallocate or change or modify what that process is. But um, if it's large enough, they go back to the neighborhood, they have a discussion, they find out what they should do. So if there are great changes, and undoubtedly there have been in some of these neighborhoods about the needs for housing, um, there's flexibility built into the system that we have with safeguards and accountability so there can be changes there. And why not if you're getting half a million dollars or whatever over a span of a few years, and not everybody is, I mean, that's the rare case, but even a few hundred thousand dollars or or even little Ken would only getting a thousand, um, they might want to look at, well, where should we put that money that we're getting? This is something we weren't exactly expecting now. We were expecting it back in June of 2010, but not now. So um, I think it is an opportunity, and I, and I fully expect um, that um, people will take that opportunity and will do that so we're making good investments in our in our neighborhoods um, and I'll be excited to see what um, what you all come up with as you're looking at that and, and doing that moving forward with your next steps so with that and seeing no other discussion then um, all those in favor please say aye aye any opposed and that motion carries then and I think with the added authors on there and I think council member before we adjourn council member Glidden has a, an announcement she wants to make Thank you, Councilmember um, Gordon. I just I, I wanted to invite people to tune in to our next uh, Intergovernmental Relations Committee, which will be at a special time uh, next Tuesday, February 7th, starting at 9.30 in the morning. Um, at that committee, we will be having some discussion of the two recent executive orders by uh, the President enhancing public safety in the interior of the United States and protecting the nation from foreign terrorist entry into the United States. We are still confirming who might be all the speakers and presenters uh, to talk, but I think it will be a very important um, discussion. Uh, the second executive order, of course, is the one that has singled out citizens from seven Muslim majority countries, including Somalia for differential treatment and restriction on the ability of those residents to travel freely to and from this country. Um, and um, combined with the president's uh, earlier comments uh, about desiring and supporting a Muslim ban, this can uh, not be interpreted as anything other than authorized state sanctioned discrimination on the basis of religion. And uh, in the city of Minneapolis, of course, we are home to the largest Somali community in the United States. Um, our residents um, uh, are affected by this. Our city employees are affected by this. Uh, children in our schools are affected by this. And I want to say it is not just people who are from the seven identified Muslim majority countries who are affected, but frankly, because of the chaos within which this executive order has been started to be executed, 
almost anyone who is not a citizen of this country, or even if they are citizen of this country, but they are traveling outside of this country, they are fearful of their ability to do so safely and to return. And, um, you know, as a, a elected member of the Minneapolis City Council, when I am uh, sworn in, uh, I have to take an oath, uh, as have all my colleagues here, <clears throat> to uphold the laws, uh, not only of the city of Minneapolis, but of the United States of America, including the Constitution, uh, federal laws, state laws. And uh, when I see something that so clearly, in my opinion, violates our Constitution, as well as our federal uh, laws, I must uh, speak out against that. So uh, I invite people to tune into our meeting on Tuesday, February 7th. Thank you very much. With that, we're adjourned.